everyone, welcome back to the Red Hat Summit 2021 virtual coverage. I'm John Furrier, this is theCUBE coverage. I'm in Palo Alto with the remote interviews for our virtual conference here. We've got two great guests, CUBE alumni, Tom Anderson, VP of Ansible Automation Platform, and Robin Bergeron, who is the Senior Manager of Ansible Community, uh, Community Architect, and all the great things involved. Robin, great to see you, Tom. Thanks for coming back on. Red Hat Summit is here, virtual. Good to see you. Thanks for having us. So <laughs> since last summit, what's the updates on the Ansible community and the automation platform? Tom, we'll start with you, automation platform. What's the big updates? Yeah, so since the last summit, not a lot has happened in, the, in Ansible land, if you will. So last summit, we were talking about content collections, the packaging and distribution format for the integrations that Ansible supports. So there's a lot of effort in doing all of the Ansible content updates, collections, and making them available. As well as our commercial users. And we uh, launched last year a uh, program, a certified content program, with both our ISV partners and community partners to certify the content collections that they create, co certify them, where we work together uh, to make sure that they're uh, developed against and tested against a proper spec so that both of us can provide them to our customer bases with the confidence that they're going to be working and performing properly. And that we, Red Hat, and our partners co support those out in our customers' production environment. So that was a big deal. The other thing that we announced late last fall uh, was the private automation hub. And that's the idea where our customers uh, obviously they appreciate the idea of being able to go to Ansible Galaxy or the Ansible Automation Hub to go and grab these content collections, this, these integrations, and bring them down in their environment. But they wanted a way, but they wanted a methodology where they, or a repository where they could curate content from different sources and then manage it across their environment, the automation across their environment. Kind of leaning into a little bit of automation content as code, if you will. And um, so we launched the automation hub, the private automation hub, where that sits in our customer's infrastructure, whether that's in the cloud or on-premise or both, and allows them to grab content from Galaxy, from the Ansible Automation Hub, uh, uh, the Ansible Automation Hub on cloud.redhat.com, as well as their internally developed content and to be able to manage and provide that across their organization uh, uh, governed by a set of policies. So lots of stuff is going on, real advancements in the amount of content that we provide, uh, the amount of collections that we provide that are certified out to our customers, and then this uh, ability to curate and manage that content across the teams. I want to do a drill down on some of the unification of teams, which is a big message as well as operating at scale because that's a super value uh, proposition you guys have and I want to get in that. But Robin, I want to come back to you on the community. So much has gone on. We are now into the pandemic for almost a year and a half now. Um, it's been a productivity boom. People, developers have been working at home for a long time, so it's not a new workflow for them. But you've seen a lot more productivity. What has changed in the community since last summit? Again, virtual to virtual again, between the windows here, the event windows. You guys had a lot going on. What's new in the community? Give us an update. Yeah, well, I mean, if we go back to Summit, you know, this time-ish, you know, last year, uh, we were wrapping up more or less the, you know, as you know, we used to have, you know, everything, you would install Ansible, you would get all the modules, you would get everything, you know, it was all all, all together, which, you know, was great for new users uh, who don't want to have to figure things out. It helps them to really get up and started uh, running quickly. Um, and, but, you know, it was for a, from a community perspective, trying to manage that level of complexity turned out to be pretty hard. So the move to collections was actually great for, you know, not just, you know, from a user perspective, but also from a community perspective. Um, and we came out with uh, Ansible 2.10. Uh, that was last fall, I believe. Um, and that was the first real uh, release of Ansible where we had, you know, Collections were, were fully instantiated. Uh, we, you know, they were available on Galaxy, but you could also get them as part of the Ansible community distribution. Um, fast forward to now, you know, we just had the Ansible 3.0 release here in February, and we're looking to Ansible 4.0 here in uh, early May. So, you know, there's been a lot of activity. Uh, a lot has improved, honestly, as a result of the changes that we've made. It's made it a lot easier for contributors to get in with a smaller group that's more their size and, you know, be able to get started and identify, you know, who are their interested peers in the community. So that's been a boon for us, honestly. Um, you know, the pandemic otherwise is, you know, I think taught all of us, you know, certainly yeah. you, John, um, about the uh, 
the amazing things that we can do virtually. So we've had a lot of our uh, meetups pivot to being virtual meetups and, and things like that. And it's been great to see how how easily the community has been able to pivot around, you know, this sort of event. Um, I hope that we don't have to just keep practicing it for forever. But um, in the meantime, you know, it's enabled us to continue to get things done. Thank goodness to every video platform on earth. <laughs> yeah, well, we appreciate it. We're going to come back and talk more about that in the future, but that's practice what we all learned and, and stories. But I think I want to come back to you on the persona side of Ansible because one of the things we talked about last time that seems to be getting a lot of traction is the multiple personas. So I want to just hold on to that. We'll come back. Tom, back to, back to you. We're at Red Hat Summit. You guys have Ansible Fest, which is your own event that you guys drilled down on this so users watching can, can know this in your own community. But now we're part of Red Hat, part of IBM, which IBM thinks also happening soon as well. Red Hat Summit still is a unique event. How is Ansible fitting into the big picture? Because the, the, the value proposition of unifying teams is really consistent now with Red Hat's overall arching thing, which is operating at scale, OpenShift, uh, Robin just mentioned. Where is the automation platform going this year? What's the story here at Red Hat Summit for the automation platform? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. We've seen so and even kind of tying this a little bit to the pandemic and how it has accelerated some existing trends that we already saw. And one of those is really around the democratization of the application delivery teams. More people delivering infrastructure and applications independent of each other, which is great, more faster, more agile, uh, all of those other good, uh, good uh, uh, words that apply to that. But what that does bring up is the opportunity for um, <coughs> Replication of work, replication of uh, effort, uh, re not reusing necessarily things that are in existence already that other teams may have, maybe not complying with all of the uh, policies, if you will, the configuration and compliance policies. And so it's really kind of brought Ansible out into focus even more here uh, because of the kind of common backplane that Ansible can provide. It's a common language and a common automation backplane across these different teams and across these different personas. I mean, the great thing about what we supply for these different personas, whether it's application developers, infrastructure owners, network engineers, SecOps teams, GitOps teams, there's so many of these ops teams out there who you know, you now all want independent access to infrastructure and deploying infrastructure. And Ansible has the kind of levers that each of those can use, whether it's APIs or CLIs or event-based automation or uh, uh, webhooks, et cetera, et cetera. You know, service catalogs, UIs, all of those um, interfaces, if you will, or modalities are accessible in the Ansible automation. So it's really allowed us to be this sort of connective tissue or glue across these different silos or domains of the organization. And kind of tying it into OpenShift specifically, one of the things that we talked about last fall at our Ansible Fest was our integration between Ansible, the Ansible automation platform, our advanced cluster management product, and our OpenShift platform that allows native applications running on OpenShift to be able to talk to a Ansible automation operator that's running on that same platform to do things off-platform for it that our customers are already using Ansible for. So connecting their cloud native platforms with their existing IT ecosystems and infrastructures, systems of records, network systems, um, uh, ticketing systems, uh, you name it. So all of those sort of integrations Ansible has become the connected glue across all of these different environments, tying traditional IT, cloud IT, cloud native, you name it. So it's really been it's really been fun, and it's been uh, an exciting uh, uh, time for us inside the portfolio and uh, yeah. and out. That's a great point. Connective tissue is a great way to describe some of these platform benefits because you guys have been on this platform for a really long time, and the benefits are kind of being seen in, in the market certainly as people have to move faster. Uh, with the agility. Robin, I want to come back to you because you brought up this idea of personas. I mean, we all know DevOps, infrastructure as code has been our religion for over a decade or more, but now the word DevSecOps is more prevalent in, in all the conversations. The security is now weaved in here. How are you seeing that play out in the community? And then if Tom, if you can give some color commentary too on the automation platform, how security fits in. So. Dev, DevOps, everything's being operationalized at scale. We get that. That's one of the value propositions you have. But DevSecOps as a persona, more people want more sec. <laughs> Dev is great, more ops and standardization, more developers, agile standards, and then security, DevSecOps. 
What's your? I thought it was Dev NetSecOps. <laughs> okay, I forgot Net. We put Net in there. Well, Net, no. Network's abstracted away, you know, as we say. Yeah. So, you well, know. you know, from from my perspective, um, you know, there are people in their jobs all over the places, right? Like they, you know, the more they can feel like they're efficient and doing great stuff at their work, mm -hmm. like they're happy to bring as many people into the fold as possible, right? And, you know, normally security's always been this, you know, it's sort of like networking, right? It's always been this sort of isolated, this special group over here that's the the traditional, you know, one of the traditional IT bottlenecks that, that causes us to not be able to get anything done. But, you know, on a community level, we see folks who are interested in security, you know, all the time. I know uh, we've certainly done quite a bit of work with uh, some folks at IBM around one of their products, which I assume Tom will... Uh, get more into here in just a moment. But from, you know, a community perspective, I mean, we've seen people who've been writing, you know, playbooks and uh, roles and, you know, now collections for, uh, you know, all the traditional government testing, you know, is our, you know, NIST standards, all of that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's one of those, it's, part of network effects. And it's a great place for actually Automation Hub, I think, you know, for folks who are on-prem or, you know, any of our customers are really going to start to see lots of value is how it will be able to connect folks inside the organization, you know, organically through just the place where I'm doing my Ansible things, it allows them to find each other, really, and build those, you know, take it from being silos of automation everywhere into a really sort of networked, you know, in internal network of, of Ansible friends and uh, Ansible power users that, you know, can work together and collaborate, you know, just the same way that we do in open source. Yeah. And Tom, so IT modernization requires security. What's your take on this? Because, you know, you got cluster, cl a lot of cluster, advanced cluster management issues. You got to deal with the modern apps that are coming. IT's got to evolve. What's your take on all this? Yeah, not only does IT have to evolve, but it's a sort of integration of IT into the rest of the environment to be able to respond to security threats. So, one of the areas that we put a lot of effort into with Ansible in terms of curating a solution is around Ansible security automation. And we've talked about that in the past, the idea of connecting SecOps teams that are doing intrusion detection or threat hunting, and then responding in an automated way to those threat detections, right? So connecting SecOps with IT, which has traditionally been siloed operations and siloed teams. And now with this curated Ansible security automation uh, solution that we've brought to market, uh, with our partners, it connects those two teams in a, in a seamless sort of way. And we've done a lot of work with our friends at IBM around this area because they are uh, big in that security area with their resilient IT radar and other products in their portfolio. So we've done a lot of work with them, but we've done a lot of work with lots of our partners, whether it's CyberArk, Microsoft, or whoever. We've done a lot of work in those, those areas. So traditionally, Ansible has done a great job on sort of compliance uh, around configuration uh, enforcement, right? Setting and, and enforcing configuration. Now we've moved into connecting SecOps with IT, uh, with security automation, and now with our acquisition of SecOps, along with our advanced cluster management integration with Ansible, we're starting to say what are the things inside that DevSecOps workflow that may require integration with or automation, uh, packaged automation, automation with other parts of the environment. So we're bringing all of those pieces together as we move forward, which is really exciting for us. Okay, I got to ask you guys the number one question that I get all the time and I see in the marketplace, kind of a combo question, um, is how do I accelerate the automation of my cloud native development with my traditional infrastructure? Because as people put in green, uh, if born in the cloud projects, whether it's, whether, and then integrating it with the cloud on, on premises with the traditional infrastructure, how do I accelerate those two environments? How do I automate, accelerate the automation? Yeah, so. It's, 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 it's a, a great story for us in there because what we were talking about last fall in Ansible was so about bringing together of our advanced cluster management product, our open chip platform, and Ansible. I mean, Ansible is just in you know, widespread use through all of the automation of both traditional and cloud native infrastructure, whether that's cloud infrastructure, on premise, storage, compute, network, you name it. Customers are using Ansible, or users are using Ansible to do all kinds of pieces in existing infrastructure. Being able to tie that to their new cloud native initiatives without having to redo all of that work that they've already done to integrate that um, existing um, infrastructure automation with their cloud native stuff, I think accelerates substantially the uh, what I call the oper operationalization, easy for me to say, operationalization of their cloud native platforms 
with their existing IT infrastructure and their existing IT uh, ecosystem. I believe that that's where the Ansible Automation Platform plays a key role in connecting those two pieces together without having to redo all that work that's been done and invested in there. Robin, what's your take on this? This is what people are working on in the trenches. They realize cloud benefits, they got some cloud native action, and also they got the on the traditional environment, they got to get them connected and automated. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the, the beauty of Ansible, you know, from an end user perspective is, you know, how easy it is to learn and how easy the language is to learn. And I think, you know, that, that portability, you know, it doesn't matter like how much of a rocket scientist you are, you know, everybody appreciates simplicity. Everybody appreciates being able to hand something simple to somebody else and letting other people get done and, and having it be more or less in a, it's not quite English, but it's definitely, you know, Ansible is quite readable, right? Um, and, you know, when we looked at, you know, when we started to work on all the Ansible operators, you know, one of that, one of the main uh, pieces there was making sure that that simplicity that we have in Ansible is brought over directly into the operators. So just because it's cloud native doesn't mean you suddenly have to learn, you know, a whole set of new languages. Ansible is just as portable there as it is to any other part of the your IT organization, infrastructure, whatever it is that you have going on. Well, there's a lot of action going on here at Red Hat Summit 2020. One of the things I wanted to bring up in context of the show um, is the success or and the importance of you guys having Ansible collections. This has come up multiple times. Um, as we talked about those personas and you got these new contributors, you got people contributing content. Um, as open source continues to grow and be phenomenal value proposition. Touch on this uh, concept of collections. What's the updates? Why is it important? Why should folks pay attention to it and continue to innovate with collections? Okay, so from a commercial perspective, from a product perspective, uh, collections we've done has made it a lot easier for contributors to create and deploy and distribute content uh, to the end user. Uh, as Robin was mentioning earlier, the previous uh, iterations of Ansible had all of that integration, all of those collections, all within one bit. We call it batteries included back at the time, back in the day, right? But that that meant that for contributors um, to be able to deploy their content with the base Ansible distribution, they had to wait for the next version of Ansible to come in. Right, that's when that content would get redistributed with the next version of Ansible. By decoupling content from the core engine and putting that into collections that are individual uh, elements of, of related integrations, those things can move at their own pace. So users and customers can get the content they need in a uh, pace that contributors like and can keep up with. Right? So uh, customers don't have to wait for the next version of the shipping product to get a new version of the migration that they really like to have. So again, by decoupling those things, it allows them to move at different paces. The engine or the platform itself needs to be stable, perform, and secure. It's going to move at a certain life cycle. The content itself, all the different content, you know, the cloud providers, the network providers, the Red Hat platforms, all of those things can now move at their own pace. And each of those have their own life cycle and their deployment speed. It allows us to get more functionality into our customers' hands a lot quicker, and then uh, launching our certified program partners where we support that content. We certify and support that content. That's one of the values that we bring to our customers with the subscription is that ecosystem of ISV partners that we work with to certify and support the stuff that we ship and support with our customers. So it kind of benefits both on the access to the technology as well as to the access to the value app that Red Hat brings to this in terms of integration, testing, and support. Robin, what's your take on the community? I see custom automation with with uh, the connector. A lot of action going on with collections. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's been interesting. You know, uh, Tom just mentioned the you know how everything previously all had to be released all at once, right? And if you think about, you know. Sure, I have Ansible installed, but, you know, how often do I have to, you know, just even as a regular, I'm not a system administrator these days uh, type person, like, how often do I have to, you know, click that button to update, you know, my Mac or my Linux uh, machine or, you know, my Windows machine or, you know, the operating system on my telephone, right? Every time one of these devices that Ansible connects to or a program or whatever it is connects to something, those things are all operating and, you know, developing themselves at, at their own paces, Right. So when a new version of, you know, uh, uh, 
well, we'll call it Red Hat Enterprise Linux. When a new version of Red Hat Enterprise Linux comes out, uh, if there are new changes or new features that, you know, we want to be able to connect to, that's not really helpful when we're not releasing for another six months, right? So it's really helped us, you know, from a community angle uh, to be able to have each of these collections working in concert with, you know, like, for example, in RHEL, like the Linux subsystems that are actually making things that will be turned into collections, right? Like SE Linux or uh, System D, right? Like those things move at their own pace. We can update those at our own pace in in collections, and then people can update those collections without having to wait another six months or eight months or whatever it is for a new version of Ansible to come out. It's uh, really made it easier for all of those, you know, developers of content to work on their content and their, you know, Ansible relationships almost in sync and make sure that, you know, both not, I'm going to do it over here and then I'm going to come back over here and fix everything later. It's more of a, you know, continuous so the development experience, process. So the ex contributor experience everything. is better than you'd say. I'm sorry? The contributor experience is better than. Oh, this. absolutely. Yeah, 100%. I mean, it's, 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 you know, there's something to be said for, I wouldn't say it's a, like instant satisfaction, <laughs> but, but certainly the ability to have a little bit more independence and be able to release things as, as you see fit and not be gated by the entire rest of the project is amazing for those folks. All right, so, so I'll put you on the spot, Robin. So if I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a developer, bottom line me, what's in it for me? What's, why, why should I pay attention to collections? What's the bottom line? <sighs> Well, you know, Ansible is a platform and Ansible benefits from, from network effects. Um, you know, the reason that we've gotten as big as we have is sort of like the snowball rolling downhill, right? Yeah. The more people that latch on to what you're doing, the more people benefit and the more, you know, additional folks want to join in. So, you know, if I, if I was working on any other product that I would consider being able to have automated with Ansible, um, uh, you know, the, the biggest thing that I would look at is, well, you know, what are those people also using? Are they automating it with Ansible? And I can guarantee you 99% of the time, everything else that people are using is also being automated with Ansible. So you'd be crazy to not, you know, want to participate and make sure that you're providing the best, you know, Ansible experience for, you know, your application. Because for every application or, you know, device that we can connect to, there's probably 20 other competitors uh, that also make similar applications that, you know, folks might also consider in lieu of you if you're not using, if you're not providing Ansible content for it. Hey, make things Sounds easier, simple to use, and you reduce the steps it takes to do things, that's a winning formula, Tom. I yeah. mean, when you make things that good, and then you get the network effect. But this highlights what you mentioned earlier about connective tissue. When you use words like connective tissue, it implies an organizational, it's not a mechanism, it's not just software, it's people. There's a people experience here in the automation platform. Yeah. This seems to be the bottom line. What's what's your take? What's your bottom line? If, you, if I'm a developer, what's in it for me? Why should I pay attention to the automation platform? Hey, so, if I'm a developer, what kind of excites me is more people using what I do. Anything from the automation platform, again, crossing those domains and silos and sort of issue across these tools and these personas. Means those contributors, those developers that are creating automation content and get it in the hands of more people across the organization faster <laughs> in a more simplified way by using the Ansible automation. Consumers, they get access, right? The consumers of the automation itself, those personas, they get access to existing automation faster. They get up and running for the best code on their part, required for a low code or no code folks. And to reinvent the wheel in terms of automation when we're trying to make a application of that sort, we want to make more know about the details of what it takes to configure the network, configure the storage elements. They rely on those automation developers or contributors to be able to do that for them and make it available. And that's really one of the powers of the platform itself, is that sharing across those teams, across those domains. Uh, those Again, what I talk about connecting SecOps to IT ops, connecting SecOps to network ops, being able to do all of these tasks with the same language and the same integration content, and just both get some up and running faster and uh, get some out of their kind of core responsibilities without worrying about the underlying risk. Robin, you wanted to talk about something um, in, in the community. Any updates? I think Navigator, you mentioned, you wanted to mention a uh, plug for that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, um, 
much like any other platform in the universe, uh, you know, if you don't have really great uh, tools for developing content, uh, you're kind of, you know, dead in the water, right? Or you're uh, leaving it to, to fate. So we've been working on a, a new project, um, not part of the product yet, but, you know, it's sort of in a community exploratory phrase, a release early, release often, or, you know, minimum viable project, I guess, might be the other way to describe it currently. Uh, it's a called Ansible Navigator. It's a TUI, which is like a GUI, but it's got a sort of a terminal user interface look to it uh, that allows you to, you know, develop. Uh, it's a sort of interface where you can develop content, uh, you know, all in one window, have your, you know, documentation accessible to you, have, you know, all of your test results available to you in one window, um, rather than I'm going to do something here and then I'm going to go over here and now I'm not sure. So now I'm going to go over here and look at docs and said it's all, you know, it's all in one place, um, which we think will actually, but I mean, I know the folks who have seen it have already been like, ah! but you know, it's definitely in early community stages right now. Um, it's, you know, we can give you the link. It's github.com slash Ansible slash Ansible Navigator. Uh, but a it's TUI a, versus a GUI versus a command line interface. Yeah, interface, well, which I, is, I think, how I do think, you innovate on the command line? It's a GUI or yeah. a, you know, it's, well, <laughs> it's um, you know, there, there's so many IDEs out there and I think Tom yeah. can probably talk to some of this, you know, how that might relate to VS code or, you know, many of the other, you know, traditional developer uh, IDEs that are out there. Um, but, you know, the goal is certainly to be able to integrate with some of those other pieces. Um, but, you know, it's, one of those things where, you know, if everybody's using the same tool, we can start to enforce uh, higher levels of quality and standards through that tool. Uh, there, there's benefits for everyone. Tom, yeah. I don't know if you want to add on to that in any way. Yeah, the way it's just kind of one of our focus areas here, which is making it as easy as possible for contributors to create and to make automation. And so part of that is actually you know, SDK, kind of roadmapping an SDK for Ansible that, uh, that developers and contributors can use in their IDEs. Real, real simple to build, test, and deploy the automation content. So, big folks are making that contributor, that builder's uh, life or job easier and easier. Well, thanks for coming on, Tom and Robin. Thanks for uh, sharing the uh, insight here at Red Hat Summit 21 virtual. Uh, so you guys do continue to do a great job with the success of the platform, which has been, you know, consistently growing and having great satisfaction with developers and now ops teams and sec teams and net teams, you know, unifying these teams is certainly a huge priority for enterprises because at the end of the day, cloud scale is all about operating at scale, which means more standards, more operations. That's what you guys are doing. So congratulations on the continued success. Thanks for sharing. Thanks for having us. Okay, I'm John Furrier here in theCUBE. We are remote with CUBE Virtual for Red Hat Summit 2021. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.